Hello and welcome to The Photo Bar, the podcast talking all about the business and lifestyle of photography while drinking beer. This is episode number 10, How to Be a Rad Photography Assistant or Second Photographer. Hey, my name is Matt Druin, and my goal is to help you become a better person, a better photographer, and a better entrepreneur. Today's episode is actually going to be with my old assistant and uh, second photographer, Dan Owens, who currently lives in Washington, D.C., and I just so happen to be photographing a wedding there. So while I'm there, I'm going to go ahead and interview him and talk to him about being a photography assistant and second photographer. So let's go ahead and jump in the bar in Washington, D.C. I'm in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, I have a wedding I'll be photographing tomorrow, but I am staying with a good friend of mine. His name is Dan, and he currently lives in D.C., but he used to live in Atlanta. Um, and he actually used to be my second shooter and assistant for about, what, five or six years. Um, so today, I'm going to talk to him. I just thought it would be a good idea um, to talk about the topic of being a great you know, for photography assistant and second photographer, and I thought it would be great to have a conversation with him about that. So what we have is we have four beers from Flying Dog Brewery, I believe. Um, one is called Raging Bitch. I've got Numero Uno, which is an agave cerveza. And then I have, let's see, what is this, Bloodline, with a very ruthless picture of a dog, a bloody dog. And Snake Dog, uh, an IPA by Flying Dog. So we're going to have this uh, conversation in four beers, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and open my first one. I am trying the Raging Bitch currently. Which one do you got? All right, I'm trying their Bloodline, which is a uh, blood orange ale. It's got some blood orange puree in there, so let's, let's give this a taste. I'm glad that you're very uh, in-depth about your beer choice. Mine's an Indian pale ale, and that's all it says. Oh, it's Belgium style. It's pretty damn good. All right, so we're off to a good start then. So anyways, yeah, today's topic is about being a rad photography assistant and or a second shooter. So a lot of this is going to apply, I guess, to the wedding industry in general because that's primarily what my background is, and that's primarily what Dan would help me with. Um, he would help me a lot with uh, editorial assignments and stuff like that too, but most of it was wedding stuff. And I guess I would say starting out, like if you're new to photography, um, second shooting and assisting is a great way to gain a lot of experience and make a little bit of money and build your portfolio potentially. That's obviously not the way that I started out, if anybody's been listening to this podcast for a while, but looking back on it, I think that's a good idea. So as like being an assistant or a second photographer, like you're the closest person to the primary photographer. So there's a huge factor of trust in there. When I was looking for a second photographer for weddings, I probably went through about five or six different people before I eventually found Dan. And a lot of that was not because of lack of trust, but it just wasn't a good fit for one way, one reason or another. Maybe it was because like our personalities just weren't as similar. Um, I was looking for a long-term person versus just somebody to second shoot occasionally. So yeah, I went through a lot of different people before. Eventually, I found Dan, and we've known each other for uh, what seven years, maybe seven, eight years. Yeah, at least a, at least a couple of years before we had started actually uh, doing any photography together. Um, we had met in Robert Scherer's Drawing One uh, class yeah. at Kennesaw State University, and I think uh, I think I had bought. Several months after we had met, I bought a, I believe a Nikon D3100. Oh, wow. And uh, I, I posted a picture of it to Instagram, and uh, Matt was like, hey, man, I do photography. Uh, I see you got this awesome camera. Like, let's get together and, and do some photography stuff. Uh, and we have been shooting since. Yeah, it's been a while, man. It definitely has. So, yeah, I mean... We built, obviously, a pretty good friendship prior to him helping me out. But I guess if, like, I was trying to find... Well, now I'm currently trying to find some, somebody new because, you know, you've moved to Washington, D.C. now because you've got an amazing job up here with your wife and stuff. So now I'm left in Atlanta without you, which kind of sucks. Yeah, um, I, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's all good. I'm glad to see you're moving forward and up and higher. But uh, I guess some things that I kind of look for in assistants and second shooters is, I mean, number one, professionalism, which pretty seems obvious, but 
Two is definitely a lot of trust. Um, stamina, because I think people, this, I mean, weddings are long sometimes. I mean, I think we've done some really long weddings, like 16, 20-hour days, you know? Yeah, we, we've definitely had days where, I mean, we were up at, like, the crack of dawn driving mm-hmm. to a location four or five hours out. Like Savannah. And then working, like, a 16-hour day. Yeah. And then driving back, hauling it back to Atlanta. Yeah, um, I remember yeah. a number of that we've done in like Savannah, where it's like what an eight or nine hour drive there, shoot the hell out of it all day long, and then driving back the same day. Yeah, we had to drive back the same day. I believe we had, we had like a, wedding. a Savannah wedding, yeah. and then we drove back and shot another wedding the next day on Sunday, and that was like a forty-eight hour photography session for the both of us. Yeah, we took turns like sleeping, driving, and editing photos on the way. <laughs> So stamina for sure, um, and eye for detail. I think that's kind of important. Um, humility, you know, because sometimes it's really good to be humble. Uh, humor, because I'm very sarcastic. So <laughs> if a very serious person was to hang out with me, it may not be a good fit. Someone who's not offended easily, because sometimes I think say offensive stuff to be funny. Maybe some technical knowledge. Like I think, like when you started with me, you didn't really know much about photography at all. Is that right? No, I was basically using, uh, I believe, aperture priority mode on my on my Nikon D thirty one hundred. Yeah, you basically taught me everything I know about uh, manual mode, composition, mm-hmm. lighting. Yeah, uh, yeah, just about everything I know now, I can pretty much attribute to uh, to working with you. And, and that's kind of like I guess a good point. Maybe we can talk about that later, but. Like, for me, yeah, knowing all the technicals isn't as important as a lot of other things that have nothing to do with photography, really. But, yeah, so I guess, what else should we say about that? Um, I guess it's kind of important to know, like, if you're going to approach somebody to be a second photographer or an assistant for somebody, it's important to know, um, like, their style of work, you know? And if you do decide to work with them or they decide to work with you, you know, it's important to know all their gear and how all that stuff works so you're not struggling on the day of trying to figure stuff out but yeah I mean aside from all that I mean going into the shoot you would want to know a lot of things like all the job details you know it's kind of weird I haven't really second shot that many jobs um, with anybody else but a couple times that I have a few of the photographers I worked with you know basically just gave me a time and an address other than that I knew nothing I didn't know what anybody's names were I didn't have any contact information for anybody because I got lost or anything so I think that's pretty important um, yeah, I would say one of the things that uh, this is this is an especially an important point uh, is to make sure you have all those details. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want to go in uh, and be kind of met with a, a groomsman or even the bride and not know their names. Yeah, that's kind of important. That that, that would be very embarrassing uh, for for both you and the primary photographer. Addresses, times, all that stuff. I mean, you've you've provided that like weeks in advance but mm-hmm. then again day of for sure uh, I had a text message with all of the uh, the important names at least uh, all the addresses and places I need to be and when I needed to be there yeah and I think that's all definitely important just so you can do a better job you know that's stuff you don't have to worry about you know aside from that I think one thing that's really important and one thing that's always comes up at least like when I'm in Facebook groups and stuff is is like the copyright usage and who owns what you know and Basically, the way it works, if you're being hired by somebody, they own the copyrights to everything because they're the ones hiring you. Like, you're working for them as an employee, essentially, right? And some photographers have different... Um, they, they may allow you to, say, use the photos for literally anything and everything that you want. Some may not let you use them for anything at all. Like, they just own the copyright, and you get to use none of that. Um, some will let you, like... Maybe show them in person, but you can't show them online. Some say you can put them in your portfolio online, but you can't blog them. Um, there's all kinds of variety of stuff, you know, that goes into that. So it's important to know exactly, like, what you can do with the photos, what you can't do with the photos. That way there's no issues with that that comes up. But at the end of the day, I mean, you're being hired as essentially an employee of that business, you know, and they own the copyrights of everything that you do just important to really figure all that out i think with you i mean you didn't really care too much about using wedding photos in your portfolio really at all i don't think with me uh, we kind of went into this kind of with an agreement that i wasn't really looking to to start my own business or anything like that uh i really you know joined up with you to really learn more about photography wedding photography was just really a great way to do it um it really kind of puts you in there Mm, and uh fake it till you make it kind of 
Yeah, no, I, 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 like wedding photography is pretty amazing just because it has so many elements of photography in it. You know, like it has landscape photography, product photography, portrait photography, event photography. Just it's all a bunch of different photography and one thing on a crazy timeline schedule. <laughs> You know, and the things go wrong, things come up, you got to solve problems. It's, yeah, it's, you can learn a lot real quick, for sure. Yeah, abs- absolutely. You you learn a ton working uh, a wedding. And, and and just like Matt said, like it, it's everything from portraiture to product mm-hmm. photography. I think I learned more about like product placement by working with Matt, like just <laughs> by the way we had to arrange jewelry for the shoot. And shoes and everything yeah. else, yeah, for sure. So I guess on that point moving forward, I mean, like a contract is pretty important. I mean, I would say it's probably the most important thing for sure. And it's really weird how a lot of people don't have like contracts for like separate photographers and stuff. I think for for us, we did a yearly contract just because it worked with me all the time. You know. Yeah, we we set it up for a year, but I mean, even if you're you're just doing like a, a single gig for a guy, yeah, yeah, always have a contract. I, I'm pretty sure every photographer that's doing any type of podcast or any type of education is going to really harp on this one point. Mm, absolutely. Get the details in writing. Have the contract. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's just a good thing to do just for the expectation aspect of it. I mean, it, it, there's expectations set on both sides. Everybody's very clear on what they're expecting out of everything, you know, as far as, like, how much money you're going to get paid, your copyright usage, how long you're going to be working, what the job entails, literally everything. But it's really weird how many people... They don't have contracts for like second photographers, and if you're a second photographer and you're like the person you're shooting for doesn't offer a contract or anything, definitely bring it up and get something in writing for sure. Even if they don't have anything for you to sign, make your own thing up and just you know both go over it just to make sure everybody's on the same page so there's no hard feelings. When you know maybe somebody forgets a certain detail like how much you were supposed to get paid or when you're going to get paid, how the files are supposed to be delivered and whatever else kind of comes up out of that, I guess. I guess another thing would be, as a primary photographer, and I haven't really dealt with this a lot because I've worked with you for so long, but, you know, like, if you're a second photographer and or an assistant even, and you're going to call out, like, that's pretty lame, you know, because it's, it's already stressful that you're trying to go into a job and then someone tries to call out, like, two days before, three days before, and to find somebody else to replace them is a pretty big, stressful situation, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, calling out, like, even two to three days before is a dick move. Um, calling out the day of God, is, is probably the worst thing you could do to uh, a primary photographer. It, it, it throws a monkey wrench in, you know, what really is like a once in a lifetime day for the couple that mm-hmm. that person's shooting for. It, it's just an awful thing to do. Don't do it. I would say like don't even go out drinking till three a.m. the night yeah, before. Definitely not. Like if you know you've got you've got stuff to do the next day like take it easy make sure all your gears in order have your backups yeah. have your batteries charged like be ready to go on the day of be there early yeah i mean i don't like with you i don't think you've ever missed anything like in like five or six years you've never missed a single thing which is i, I vaguely crazy. recall calling out of one thing but i'm pretty sure that it was kind of like uh, you can show up if you want to oh, kind of yeah, deal. Yeah, probably. Um, it, it definitely it, it was something like I, I think I had agreed to help you out on something, but you didn't really need the help. Mm. I, I kind of wanted just to do it for experience, and I think that's the one time I called out, and I had like a horrible stomach bug or something like that. Yeah, and that's legit. Like that's the only reason I would ever call out of work or something. I like I had an obligation. To yeah, do. for sure. I would say, I mean, if you are going to call out for any reason, like you know, something really does come up, try to give the primary photographer as much notice as possible. I mean, if, obviously, if an emergency comes up and it happens like a day before, or a couple of days before, I mean, it is what it is, but a couple of weeks or anything, but don't just bail just because you find a higher paying job or something like that. I mean, that's pretty lame. And if you do have to call out, definitely try to find a replacement for yourself um, just, just to help out the situation. Because not, I mean, you can really shoot yourself in the foot, and the photography community is pretty small, you know, so if you are pretty unprofessional and don't show up to jobs and stuff you're not going to get hired by other photographers in the future um maybe dress for the occasion you know like it's amazing how many photographers i see and videographers that don't dress properly to weddings for one but being a second photographer and not dressing properly is pretty lame too i guess i think with you you kind of just followed what what i suggested you know which i mean for us like we don't dress in all black light up 
like a lot of photographers do. I think it's creepy. It looks like you're going to a funeral. So we usually dress uh, to match what everybody else is going to be wearing so we can blend in better, which is typically what, just some express pants, express shirt. And, yeah, uh, a nice pair of iron slacks, yeah. uh, a nice iron shirt. Um, you definitely don't want to show up in, like, khakis and... Nirvana T-shirt to a, to a wedding. Or shorts. Um, flip yeah. flops. Don't don't wear shirt shorts and uh, flip flops to a wedding. No professionalism, uh, especially if, it, if it's important to the primary photographer, it should be very important to you as well. Uh, you're a representation of their business. Absolutely. And you don't want to show up looking like like he picked you up off the street some dirt bag the night is, before. Yeah, just rolls like in. gave you some cameras and fifty bucks and said, "Hey, just hang out at the wedding all day." Um, no, you want to be professional. You want to be on time. How you present yourself in your dress, honestly, has a will have a lot to do with how you're you're treated uh, throughout the day. People will see you. They'll they'll notice the professionalism that will reflect on the primary photographer. That will fl- reflect on yourself. Dress for the occasion, guys. Yeah, I definitely agree with that for sure. Um, one of my huge things is being on time. I mean, seriously, and you know this really well, and I think you live by this too, but, I mean, basically the way I look at it is 15 to 30 minutes early is on time. Being on time is late, and if you're late, then you better have a damn good excuse or don't worry about showing up ever again for sure. With Matt especially, this has always been, like, a a huge, Mm -hmm. you know, a huge concern and, and like, be on time, guys. Um, Like he said, 15 to 30 minutes early is on time. You should honestly be accounting for, like, the worst possible scenario. Say you've got, like, a two-hour commute to get to the wedding. You should be there a good hour in advance just to... Because, I mean, we've actually had occasions yeah, where yeah. we've run into an accident on a rural road out I, in the middle of nowhere. That, with the helicopters yeah, and shit. Yeah, and <laughs> a guy had to literally be <laughs> the, heli-vacked out it was a motorcycle of the hit. road. And we were probably stuck there for 45 minutes to an hour. At least, yeah. Um... And what we still made it to the wedding on time because we we early. accounted we, for we, that. We made it early. Yeah, we were still early. <laughs> uh, we still had time to prepare to to you know get a check out the surroundings, check out the scenery, work on that creative stuff, plan for the worst. It'll just help throughout the day. The, the more the, the more prepared you are, the the better the whole day goes. Yeah, no, I fully agree, and that's and that's part of my big thing is like I don't like to be rushed. I don't like to feel stressed and. If I'm running tight on time, that's one thing that starts leading straight to my, my stress level, which directly affects how my interactions are with people and how like my photography is, you know? So, yeah, definitely always be on time. I guess on the note of, of time is don't ask to leave early. You know, like, if you're scheduled to work four hours, like, you work the four hours, even, like, if there's nothing else to do, you know, like, figure out something to do. And... If you really want to make a good impression, you know, you always want to be the first one there. You want to be the last one to leave. Even if you're scheduled to work, like, say, four hours and you can see that they still need some help, I mean, just stay there and help them out. You know, help them, like, maybe at the end of the night pack their bags, even though, like, you're off and you're ready to go. Um, just make sure they have everything and, you know, just really make an impression. Like, go up above and beyond like you would with anything else. Yeah, guys, work ethic really shows... Um People are going to want to work with somebody that, that understands the way that, that this business goes. Like a, a four-hour set schedule is like a five-hour schedule in reality. You, you might, you know, want to say, listen, like, you paid me for four hours. Like, I'm good for four hours, then I'm gone. But, I mean, in most of those cases, like, the photographer isn't even being paid for that extra time. Or, you know, if, if it is stipulated in the contract that, you know, they may be. But, uh you know, you want to make a good impression. Go above and beyond. Um, don't be twiddling your thumbs at the end, like kind of just standing around waiting to leave. Yeah, that's so annoying, seriously. I mean, I've never really had to deal with that just because I had you and you've always been totally awesome. But I'm sure that happens a lot. But, like, I guess going into to the workday itself, you know, like I already mentioned, you, know, you are a direct representation of that business. You're being hired as by, you know, whatever photography company, whatever photographer to be an employee essentially you know and through the entire day you should always maintain that just like if you're shooting a wedding and like a guest comes up to you and you be like oh well you know what what photography company are you with or whatever you know you should always say the primary photographer's business name it's not your wedding it's not your business that you represent there or same thing with like business cards and stuff like I remember a couple times at a half second shot I had guests come up to me 
frequently, you know, ask me, hey, do you guys have any cards? Do you have any cards? And at that particular wedding, like, the photographer didn't give me any cards to give out. So I basically just told him, hey, you know, I don't have any cards, but I can get some from the primary photographer and get some from him. I don't think most people, I don't even know if most photographers hand out business cards to those second photographers and stuff. I, I remember I give you cards all the time. Just yeah, in case. I'm, I'm pretty sure every time we worked a wedding together, I had a like a Ziploc bag full yep. of your business cards. and Just in case. Yeah, just in case. And that's one thing you never want to do. You never, as a second photographer and assistant, you like you never want to be at a job passing out your own business cards because that's one way, real quick, to get just to piss off the primary photographer for one, but two, to, to not get hired for any other jobs in, in the industry just because people don't want to deal with that. You know, that's a pretty lame move. I guess what else can we kind of talk about? Um... In the meantime, I, I finished my first beer, and I'm <laughs> moving on to the second here. Oddly enough, my second beer is Numero Uno, an agave cerveza brewed with agave nectar with a with a hint of lime zest. You like pounding so let's, it down. Uh, let's crack this guy open. Yeah, you're like pounding them down, dude. I'm almost done with this one, I guess, though. Oh, I guess on that note, you know, you should never contact the client or anybody related to the job or anything trying to offer them your services or anything like that. Like, you should never be in contact with anybody like that. That's the primary job. And if somebody asks from the wedding or anyone else that you're shooting, you know, were to contact you, then you'd want to send them directly to the primary photographer to let them handle all that stuff. Like I said, man, if you break these rules, and you can definitely expect to never hear from that photographer for sure, but definitely probably other people in the industry as well, I mean, especially with, like, social media and stuff, word gets around pretty quick. The photography industry in general is... I mean, it's big, but it's much smaller than you think as far as networking and stuff goes. So you don't want to create a bad name for yourself at all. In general, I guess, you always just want to be very personal and you want to have a smile and always look busy. That's a, that's a big one. Yeah, standing around at a wedding uh, as a photographer is, is a big no-no. Uh, I know I am guilty of this, and, and Matt, you've definitely pointed it out when, <laughs> I, when, I, when I've twiddled my thumbs or been on my phone. The text message. But it, it all goes back to you know that appearance that's um, it that's you want to you know appear as the professional and the professional doesn't sit on his phone in the back of a wedding on snapchat how, how many times have, i've seen this from so many djs and, and like people where they're just like hanging out on the phone the majority of the time the music's going and it's i don't know it just looks like you're uninterested in, in the event you're uninterested in the people there um it's just kinda, it just looks bad you know in general I mean, honestly, if you really have nothing to do, like start Fire cleaning sun. your lens, um, start shooting some detail shots. Backup uh, photos. Don't chill at the buffet. Yeah. Uh, definitely don't chill at the bar. Yeah, <laughs> definitely don't be chilling at the bar. That's, that's probably a good one. Another thing, I, mean, I, I've actually, so I second shot a wedding probably a month ago, right, and. I didn't know either one of these, these photographers, but it was like a kind of a husband and a wife team that I was second shooting with. I overheard them like talking to the to the client that we were shooting, like the, the wedding that we were shooting. So it was, they were talking to the bride, and they were literally talking shit about other brides that they had photographed previously, on like like what a bridezilla they were, or like situations that came up, and like, literally just talking shit about other clients. I was blown away, honestly. I didn't even know what to think um, about that. That's one thing you never want to do. You never want to talk bad about the job about the v other vendors about the food about the clients about nothing even like in private at the event you know just because you never know who's going to accidentally overhear something or maybe maybe you're like standing around other vendors and the other vendors are like complaining about something you know and you kind of chime in with something and it's like you don't know who knows who or 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 anything and one of the vendors might be a friend of the bride or the groom or or whomever, you know, and word travels fast. So you never never say anything bad about anybody, for sure. Yeah, basically, one of, one of the golden ru rules applies here. Uh, if you don't have anything good Ooh. to say, uh, don't say anything at all. Yeah, I think my mom told me that when I was, like, four. Yeah, and, and don't complain, seriously. Like, do not complain. That is, like, the worst, most annoying thing, at least for me. It's like, this, why is anybody going to complain about something, you know? Especially for what we do as photographers. I mean, we're getting paid a lot of money to be a part of there's really incredible days in people's lives and like yeah we go through issues and we have stresses and maybe the vendor sandwich box really does suck but it's like you're getting paid a lot of money to take pictures of amazing people you know? I, I, I will say this um, be prepared to have some really crappy 
vendor box lunches. Yeah, we've definitely had some of those. Uh, see, what else can we talk about? Um, oh, that's a good one. So, like, being a sounding board for, like, the photographer, but not, not a creative director. You know, you, like, like, I think often, as a primary photographer, sometimes, like, I'm dealing with a lot of stuff, and I'm trying to get, like, a creative shot for, like, portraits, for example, and I'm trying to come up with ideas on the spot to get really cool stuff. And then you will have some really cool idea of like, hey, you know, like, why don't we try this out or why don't we try that out? But one thing, like, I think it's important to do, especially if it's not somebody that you work with all the time, you know, is not to, to kind of say stuff like that in front of the couple, or in front of the client that kind of demeans the primary photographer or where you start trying to take over and kind of dictate all the photo shooting things. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does make sense. I mean, I'll... Uh, when uh, the couple actually hires the primary photographer, obviously they're looking at that photographer because of their creative vision, mm -hmm. uh, because of their shooting style. Something about that is what really, you know, kicked them off to want to pick this photographer. Right. Yeah, don't uh, try and overstep your bounds or, like, show up the primary photographer in any way. Um, if you've got a good idea, it, I would say pull them aside or, or find a, you know, a, a space where you, it's just the two of you. You're right. Uh, discuss that idea with them and honestly we we've worked together for a long time and e even still though you know I, I'm not gonna you know blurt out my ideas in front of a bride or a groom you know but well, sometimes I, I actually gave you like creative control you know I just say all right, all right you do whatever you want Dan you know I think that's more me pushing you than yeah but, else. but that that kind of went along with the relationship yeah, we had true. And, and, and just the time we've spent shooting together yeah absolutely yeah for sure I guess the same thing could be true, like, if you were, like, new and you're just trying to learn stuff, like, don't ask questions every five seconds. Like, like when the primary is trying to, like, set up lights or, or trying to shoot or trying to pose or trying to do this, and you're trying to ask like, a million questions on, on why they're doing a specific thing or what a specific piece of equipment does or something like that, you know? Like, in, in doing all that in front of the client, I mean, that, one, it just kind of makes you look like you really don't know what you're doing, which is not very good on the primary or yourself, but also it slows down the primary from doing stuff because they're, they're trying to explain things along the way or there's, you know, they're busy. So, but that's something you could talk about, like, in the downtime, you know, and maybe like, hey, you know, why were you using that particular light or why did you put that light there or, you know, why did you pose in this way instead of this way? That's the time to kind of do that. And I, I think you did that quite often, you know? Yeah, especially because I kind of went into this whole thing with, with not a lot of the technical background uh, as far as photography goes. So I, I definitely had a lot of questions about um, what was the focal length you used for this shot? Uh, you know, what were your, your manual settings? What was the aperture, ISO? All, yeah. all, the, all the stuff that goes into technical. Um, I really didn't have a firm grasp on when I first started shooting with you. So I definitely had a lot of questions. And... Yeah, you know, there are down times during the day. Mm -hmm. You know, there will be multiple locations. There will be travel time. And those are excellent opportunities to, to really touch base with the photographer, you know, ask your questions and, and get the answers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm personally like, I'm all about teaching and helping other people. I mean, obviously, that's the reason why I even do this podcast. But choosing the right time is, is, is an important aspect for sure. See, I guess another thing might is, is kind of stepping up, you know, like being better you know, than, than what you're just hired to do and that might actually be to take over as for the primary for a bit so they can take a break I mean obviously if you're just starting it may not be as good but if you've been doing photography for a while and you can actually you know just take over for five or ten minutes just to give the primary photographer a break or like what if they get sick or something you actually really do have to take over you kind of need to be prepared for that um, or if something else comes up and they have to leave the wedding for whatever reason like you would be the next person in line to, to take over for the rest of the day. I don't think that's ever happened to us. I mean, with, we've definitely taken breaks, but not with us. I think there have been definitely times. I remember a couple of venues that we've shot. Only one photographer could be in an area at a oh, time. Oh yeah, that's true. There have definitely been weird stipulations where I've had to like be separate from you. Yeah. And and you only had such and such time to shoot the bride. But then you couldn't be shooting the groom at the same time. Right. So obviously I would have to step up and, you know, take charge with the groomsmen and, and handle all that. make sure all those photos that needed to be taken got taken. And then, you know, we would meet up for the for the actual ceremony. Yeah. And uh, I guess yeah, it's something um, those things happen. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess it's something kind of unique to us as well as like I'm, I'm very OCD about stuff. So like I always will shoot the groom. I always shoot 
the bride or, or the couple, you know, whoever it is. I shoot literally every single thing myself, even though, like, like you might be there as a second photographer. And, you know, some photographers, they, like, they might split up, you know, like the, the bride is shot by ex primary photographer usually and like the groom or who the partner or whoever is shot by the other photographer whereas with us it's like I always shot everything myself every single time and you would be shooting everything yourself every single time too like we didn't really split up very often unless we actually like had to like yeah. in those that venue situations they're, they're, those were very yeah. rare occasions uh, but that goes back to one of the, the earlier points you mentioned talking to the photographer you know knowing their style uh, knowing what the yeah. photographer looks for in the shoot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the yeah, kind, the yeah. kind of photos that the, the other photographer takes. Like, if you get split up, it's gonna, it's there. Someone's gonna be able to tell that someone else took these photos, yeah. unless you're you're familiar yeah, you're with, with the, the style. Word. Yeah. Um, like, I don't think you ever, like, you didn't shoot exactly like me by any means. Like, you had your own very kind of unique look, but it was very similar to mine. I guess a lot of that was because I trained you like my way. Yeah. Uh, which is what I want it um but you still even though you shot similar to me you still had your own kind of unique look to your photos you know yeah, there was a, a definitely a, a unique look you know it, it probably goes back to the time we'd spent together and, and just knowing yeah the shots that you were looking for yeah at least the shots yeah because we have a very particular aside from the standard you know shots that everybody gets at weddings we had a very particular set of other photos that we always did yeah that's that's a good point um i think also too it's like, I guess on the shooting aspect of it, it's really important not to always shoot from the same direction as, like, the primary photographer or, like, shoot over the shoulder, which I think, like, when we first started, you did a lot of, because I think a lot of, you didn't know what to shoot. You would, like, you would be behind me. I remember a couple times you were behind me, and I would back up and, like, just, like run right into you. Yeah, one of, one of the first weddings we did together, I think there were actually three photographers. Yeah, it, it was somewhere in the mountains, and it was you and I, and then another photographer was with us. And oh yeah, I, think I remember we that. We were all basically shooting the same thing with the same camera, and the you same know, the same basic setup. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, after that, after that first, uh, it was one of the very early weddings. Yeah, I remember you know, that we, wedding. We, we definitely talked about it, and, and we kind of came to this agreement: if I'm shooting, you know, long, yep. shoot wide. Exactly. Um, if I'm shooting this angle, try and grab it from the side. Exactly. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can capture from one perspective and completely miss from another. And no, yeah, totally. I mean, you're only one set of eyes. And that's kind of the point, I guess. It's like, there's no reason for two of the exact same photo. So it's like, you always want to shoot from different viewpoints, shoot from different focal range. Um, or like sometimes, you know, like I would be shooting the, like the family, like the family portraits or whatever. And you would be, sh- I would have you shoot from the side as capturing really tight emotions of people laughing and stuff. Especially the second, like I would take the family photo and put the camera down then everybody kind of gives into those funny reactions and starts laughing and having a good time. And those are the kind of moments that you would take. Yeah, some of the best photos I personally think I've taken were some of those after ceremony family pictures, yeah. where the primary photographer is getting the the standard. Yeah. Here's the bride and the groomsmen. Here's the groom and the bridesmaids. Exactly. All those pictures, but on the sidelines, I would be shooting either a different focal length, or I, I would be basically capturing the behind the scenes emotions that are going around and, and going on while he's shooting all the main stuff. Yeah, exactly. And that's the same thing with, like, like speeches or anything else. I mean, like, I would might, might be shooting, like, the primary, like, person giving the speech, and you would be capturing, like, reactions from the bride and groom. I mean, I would be shooting... I would, I would personally be doing both. I'd be trying to shoot the person giving the speech and the reactions and stuff, but you would kind of be doing the same, but focusing more on, say, the bride and groom at the table or whatever. Yeah, I think that's, that's really important. And I think... With all that, it adds a lot of complimentary photos to what I'm already getting, you know, so you can tell a, like a better, more in-depth story. And then if I were to miss something, you're still getting it, at least from a different viewpoint, you know. I also think, you know, as a second photographer, it's um, it, it's kind of a cool position. Like, I, when I started out weddings, obviously, I didn't second shoot at all. I just kind of jumped into weddings. And it was probably a couple of years before I actually started really second shooting anything. And I probably second shot about maybe six times at this point. But every single time, like, I think I'm actually trying to start doing it more because it gives you a lot of freedom. Like, you don't have the pressure and the stress of, like, the main photographer capturing all the, the normal stuff that you have to capture, you know? So you have a lot more time to kind of be risky and brave and really kind of try some, some crazy-ass shit. And that, for me, is fun. 
And so that's why I think I'm going to start second shooting a little bit more just so I can, can do that and kind of push my own boundaries more and, and learn um, by doing that sort of thing. And I think you did that a lot. Like I would, I would have you do some crazy stuff or sometimes I would have like I would have you shoot all the boring primary stuff so I can go out and shoot all the crazy fun stuff. Maybe don't call it the boring stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe it wasn't boring, but you know the standard stuff. Just so I could be a little bit more creative and, and, and take more risk, you know. Or, you know, I would, I would push you a lot to do that, you know, since you were, you had that flexibility. Yeah, you, you could definitely cover uh, the major points, you know, the shots that you're supposed to get at the wedding. And in the meanwhile, you, you'd have me with the fairy lights or the prism. Yeah. Like, Standing on top of a building, trying to yep. trying to do crazy <laughs> stuff whenever we could, and make you climb trees, get on the balconies, rooftops. <laughs> we've we've pretty much done it all, which is something I really valued in you because I, I don't know if I could tell everybody to hey go climb a tree and, and get these cool photos or, yeah, or, or going, get into that river. <laughs> like going back to like going the extra mile in, in, in whatever you do, you know. Yeah. You know, not just photography or, or in your job. Or just in work. life. Yeah, just in life. Yeah. I mean, there were definitely occasions where I think it, it was raining for one wedding, and um, it totally just ruined everything. There was no backup plan. What we did was I, I got in my car, and I drove to the dollar store. I remember and, that. And I literally <laughs> bought something like a hundred umbrellas. dollar umbrellas. No, you, had, you went to like four or five different stores to get all these that, umbrellas. That's right. I had to go to a uh, dollar store, Walmart. I, I bought out all the umbrellas at a target. Yeah. I bought out all the umbrellas at a dollar store. Yep. And, uh, we just got, we just brought umbrellas for I, everybody at the wedding. I remember that. Like, cause my idea was like, like you know, the bride and groom they, at that point, I think they were pretty really upset, you know, and we couldn't do the, the ceremony inside. So it, we didn't really have an option, so I basically just, I calmed him down and said, you know what, we're going to make the most badass fucking photos ever. We're going to do the ceremony in the rain and just roll with it. And they're like, well, are you sure? And I'm like, dude, it, it will turn out amazing and epic. I remember that. And well, they were like, well, what about all the guests and stuff? And at that point, we didn't have anything. And he's like, you know what, Like, I'm going to send Dan out right now. He's going to go buy a bunch of freaking umbrellas, and we're going to have wedding outside the ceremony. You know, it's going to be in the rain. We're going to give everybody umbrellas. And they, they were seriously blown away. I remember they they immediately stopped crying. They, they they were just they felt so much better. They were like, all right, yeah, like l- let's do it. And they were blown away that we were going to go out and buy all these umbrellas. <laughs> and yeah, that's literally what we did though. And everybody had an umbrella. And those wedding those photos literally were amazing. Yeah, they're unique. Definitely one of a kind. You you definitely don't see a lot of uh, wedding pictures where everybody is holding an umbrella. And we specifically got those uh, the clear ones. the clear umbrellas yeah. so like you could shoot through them. And it really created some great pictures. It created some great memories. And those are hard to get. Yeah. Apparently, because we figured that out. We were trying to find them. I remember that. That's, that. Yeah, that's cool. What else can we talk about? I guess you know, you know, if you're as a second photographer, like, what else can you be doing besides shooting the normal, normal stuff? I mean, I guess you could be shooting what, like details, like, like details of buildings, you know, like landscape photos, the surrounding areas and locations, uh, close-ups of of the dress, you know, um, table shots. I guess really anything. Yeah, it, 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 I think uh, what um, being a photographer really boils down to is, is situational awareness mm-hmm. and be able to creatively capture that. So yeah, even the most mundane objects could be could have a sentimental value or yeah. or just be something that you know the bride or groom might miss throughout the day that they can look back on a photo later or can tell a deeper story. Yeah, yeah. or can tell a deeper yeah. story. Absolutely shoot what the photographer isn't shooting yeah every time keep, keep yeah situational awareness just keep an eye out for what the photographer might miss um all the emotion that's happening in the background behind the scenes photos yeah oh yeah um, that's a good ass one yeah a lot of photographers can't really take pictures of themselves nope. too easily um and it's a great thing to have for the photographer uh it's a great thing to have, like for the for the v- different vendors, yeah. for the venue. Yeah. Um, so shoot. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. So maybe shoot um, photos of the primary photographers. Shoot um, photos of other vendors working and stuff. Because yeah, that's really important, and that's something that we did a lot of. Like, because I mean, you can't shoot photos of yourself, and it's hard to get those cool behind the scenes shots so you can post them on Instagram or use them for your website or like vendor relations. I and mean, that's really important. That's a huge way to get more business. And if you can like shoot some pretty awesome photos of vendors working in, in their element that they can use for Instagram and use for their websites, that's yeah, that's a really amazing point. Yeah, we, we got excellent pictures of DJs, of bands, of, yeah, like caterers. everybody working the venue, yeah. caterers. This is the one scenario where I will say 
that, all right, maybe it's okay to get on your phone and do, like, an Instagram, but as long yeah. as it's going mm-hmm. towards, like, the, the wedding, the whole vibe the of goal, that, yeah. taking some behind-the-scenes yeah. photos, posting them to Instagram, what you're doing is you're helping the photographer out, you're helping yourself out. Yeah, yep. um, the vendors, everybody. It just, it's a win-win-win, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's kind of funny you bring up um, situational awareness and paying attention to your background. So that's something that's really important, you know, as a second photographer, or as an assistant, is to stay out of the freaking way of the primary. Like, like if the primary is trying to shoot photos and you're standing in the background of where they're trying to shoot, it, and they capture, like, an amazing photo and you're just, like, some goon in the background, you just totally just ruin that photo. I think we got really good at that. I think just from working with each other for a while, like, we just instinctively knew like if I was doing something that you knew where not to be at and what to do and vice versa I mean and as a primary I would watch out for you too just to so I wouldn't be in your shots because I yeah, would, we basically yeah. we basically had like I'm so many degrees like in one direction from you at all times yeah I'm um, shooting a different focal length and I, I'm, I'm always in a position where I'm not going to be in your shot you're not going to be in my shot um, but we're capturing yeah the same thing but in a on a different perspective, which can can change the story behind the photo tremendously. No, absolutely. And I think, well, and there for us too, I think, I guess it's a little bit different than if you're just like a random second photographer showing up for one job, you know, type of thing. But that's just a good, good thing is to always just stay out of the way, make sure that you're not, you know, in somebody else's photographs, so always paying attention not to where they are and vice versa. But I think for us, it became a little bit different because we worked together for so long that we, we just knew the rhythm, you know, and it was just kind of weird. I don't know, it's almost like we were one person just in two different spots at, at times, you know? So I guess we just we had that advantage working so long together. How many weddings would you say that we've actually shot together? Uh, let's it's, see. Is it the dozens now? It has to be. I, I would say close to 100, probably at least, right? We, we have shot a lot of weddings together. And, um, yeah, when, when we go into mm-hmm. a wedding, it's, you know, we've got our routine. Yeah. Because we've yeah. worked together for so, so long. long. That yeah. We, we have it down. You know, we go in, if you've got the 105, then I've got, like, a wide angle, and, yeah, I mean, we've worked it down to a science, and I'm sorry to have left you <laughs> and moved to D.C. I know, you're killing me, man, seriously, like, I, you don't understand how different things are for me now. I mean, I've always shot weddings by myself, or, or set it up to where I could shoot them by myself, and, I mean, and that's what I've done now, that's what I do now, obviously, and, and I want to find somebody else uh, as a replacement for you, but you've made it so damn hard to do that just because you're such an exceptional person in general and like we have such good chemistry and we get along so well and the amount of time and effort you know we've put in together you know to become a better team I mean honestly like you're a huge part and reason why my business is so successful and where it is now really just, appreciate that yeah over that over that time seriously because I mean like I've been shooting and been in business for like seven years and you've been with that for five six years um, so yeah, that's a, that's a huge amount of time, man. Lots of good memories. Yeah. Lots of fun weddings. Uh, lots of good stories. Hor- horrible things. Like <laughs> we've we've had it all for sure. Uh, do you remember the time I dropped the wedding dress? dress I do from remember the that second story. They this this couple had just moved into a new home, and we were we were doing some creative stuff off of the second story of their house. Um, there was a huge window behind this this area it was a like a loft Mm -hmm. space uh the sun was shining through and i was trying to hang the dress off the second story you know as things happen the dress ended up falling and i just just, i I think i was in shock probably the rest of the day yeah i almost thought you were about to cry seriously (laughs) you you were so scared Uh, but i mean this place was like a mint condition there wasn't even a speck of dust anywhere but so i mean it wasn't a huge issue it really wasn't but um yeah i remember that so well yeah, I think it was kind of a combination between maybe you weren't using two hands at the time and, and the hanger. The hanger, I'm pretty sure, was like... The Some of thing. it was definitely the hanger. It was probably a dangerous shot to begin with, but, you know, that's what you're kind of known for is getting these really creative shots. Well, speaking of that, I remember, like, probably it was probably a year after that when we hung the, and did the, the, the wedding dress. It was like a 20-story hotel, and we did it from, like, the 15th floor, and I shot across from that. And yeah, it I was. remember this, <laughs> and it was also during Dragon Con. Oh yeah, so, so there was like hundreds and hundreds of people. Cosplayers there. like flooding the the lobby of this yeah. hotel, and we're probably, you know, fifteen stories up at yeah, least, and we're hanging this dress just over the edge, out in the edge of this 
It would fall down. Stories up. It would literally it would, fall down into like the middle of the hotel if it, if it dropped to the ground. Yeah, and <laughs> and in the lobby, surrounded by cosplayers and all all these people, um, just to get because they had this really cool chandelier up there, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and, that, and the elevator. Yeah, so yeah, it worked out. We didn't drop the dress. Nope, nope. I think you learned from the first one for yeah. sure. Yeah, <laughs> after that first dress dropping, I, I got a much tighter hold on any wedding dresses that I was holding on to. Uh, okay, I guess let, let's move on. So let's, I guess let's talk about like after the shoots. Um, like, so what would be the most important things if this is for a second photographer or an assistant? I guess for a second photographer, one of the most important things would be like getting the the photos, you know, to the primary photographer right away. And like, well, for us, I mean, we back up all of our work before we even leave the wedding. We actually back it up throughout the day. Do you, Do you have a podcast segment on your uh, backup your workflow? Your backup workflow. Um, I don't think I've created one yet. I mean, I have a YouTube video that walks everybody through like a detailed version of my backup workflow. But I'm gonna make a podcast. That's a good. Uh, good point. Check out Check out the YouTube video yeah. of his backup. It's backups on backups, backups. on backups. Uh, before we leave a wedding, there are two backups. At least, well, there's a total of four. Yeah. Oh, because everything is redundant. Yeah. So there's redundant backups of the two main backups, and then we have the actual cards. Yeah, that, that's the reason why there's four. There's the primary card that we shoot on, then there's the backup in the camera, you know, with the second card. Then there's the first hard drive and then the second hard drive. So there's a total of four before we leave the wedding. Yeah, so yeah, yeah getting the photos to the, the primary photographer, um, making sure that, you know, goes back to that contract and the expectations that are set. Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely helps their workflow. Yeah, that's the, I think that's one of the biggest things is like, if I didn't have those photos, and like like for me, I try to turn around my weddings back to my, my couples within a week or two. So it's like if I don't have those from you, then that slows my process down, you know? So I guess if, if you know, if you're not working with a, another photographer on a consistent basis, like, like get them to them as fast as possible, whether that's like the night of, which I think would be the best way to do this so you know you for sure have done it and you can get paid and everything's done. Um, but maybe you deliver through like Dropbox or you meet up at a different time. But regardless, I mean, always want to make sure that you get those photos over to them as fast as possible to help speed up that post-production process. What else? I, well, f- like something like feedback. You know, I think that's pretty critical. I think we've talked a lot. I, we well, we've met up a number of times where we've gone over like you're in everything that you've shot. You know, from start to finish and critiqued everything. Um, yeah, we we've had some pretty in-depth critique uh, sessions. Uh, I remember when I first started out, probably one of the the main things I remember was one of our one of our early critiquing sessions and this is something you know we'd been doing since art class and, yeah and drawing one and two um is is getting in there diving into how can i be a better photographer yep um i remember i shot a lot what was the word you use I, I would shoot consistently above people's heads and have just a lot of i had that same problem when i started though blank space and not a lot of stuff a, a, going a on. a lot of negative space yeah. uh, like above people yeah so, uh, yeah, I had the same problem, too. But, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, well, we used to go through, and I used to always say something about that. And one thing that, like, solves that problem, I think, is if you move your, it's like, your, your focal point, instead of having a dead center, for example, you move it up, like, two spots, you know? So where you focus that way, it always pushes your camera down more. But, yeah, I remember that. And that's something really important. Like, if you, like, second shoot a wedding, to, to get feedback from the primary photographer, and hopefully the primary photographer is cool enough to, like, take some time out of their day to give you some feedback, but, like, people that would second shoot with me, like, like you or anybody else, like, I would definitely take time because I think that's really important. That's how you learn to get better at your photography. That's learn how to be a better, like, second shooter, a better assistant, or whatever you're doing is to get feedback on how you can improve what you did right, what you didn't uh, do right, what you could do better, and things like that for sure. I mean, that's how you, you learned, you know? Yeah, like but, I said, I, I really came into photography with no experience I was using the automatic mode on the camera. Mm-hmm. You taught me how to shoot manual. Uh, that that could be a podcast in itself, learning how to shoot manual and just the benefits of being able to control understand the, the golden triangle of, you know, how the photography, how the camera works. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I grew exponentially as a photographer under, yeah. under, you know, working with you. Yeah, and no, I agree. And I, th- I think also, like, not just your photography, but, like, your business skills. Like, I mean, I, th- I think... At this point, you, I mean, even before this point, probably, you could literally open up your own business and be able to run it start to finish pretty pretty easily. Yeah, there, it, there's a lot of the behind-the-scenes stuff about running a business. Yeah, um, a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff. Yeah, the, yeah. There's, 
that that's a whole other story that you know there's another two or three podcast <laughs> sessions just on the behind the scenes yeah. running a business uh, but I definitely feel comfortable now um, if I had to shoot a wedding by myself I could do it well I you think, have done that I remember? think you, yeah I think you trust me like if something happened to you mm-hmm. be like Dan I I, I can't do it. Can you cover for me? Yeah. Like, I, I feel comfortable doing that. I, I feel comfortable doing any, any kind of portrait or engagement or wedding sessions now. And I definitely didn't have that before. And that's one of the things that came with second shooting and, and working with another photographer to be comfortable uh, in a level where you can show confidence in your work and, you know, really provide a great experience. Or, yeah, even confidence to, like, the clients and stuff. I mean... You didn't just shoot with me. You you started you branched out on your own. You started shooting a lot of what like like hair and I mean what you were. So I, I've, I've always worked with um, good friends in different industries. So I, I have a very good friend that that owns a salon in Atlanta, uh, Jacob Kahn. You should check him out. You know, go get some color done. Plug uh, plug. Uh, we went to high school together, so you know we had a, a good relationship going into this, but. Um, he submitted to a lot of these competitions um, and I shot the hair and the portraits and uh, we did a lot of creative work together. I wouldn't have had the experience. I wouldn't have had the knowledge to go do that stuff or if maybe, I hadn't. I don't think the confidence either because I remember when you first started with me, you weren't very confident in yourself, you know? I mean, I'm still not very confident. I, we, had, we had a conversation yesterday about, you know, different personality types. Yeah. You're, a, you're definitely a type A personality. Yeah, so. I'm more of a type B personality. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, having worked with you for so long, doing that second shooting, putting myself out there, uh, it helped me get more confident in my ability, mm-hmm. more confidence in myself. I'm definitely able to do all of that now. I don't know that I'd be fully confident running my own business. But you'd but always I, have I probably, me for help. I probably could do it. You could do it. And, and if you had an issue, you could always call me. I think you could do it totally fine. Yeah, for sure. You, you, you definitely could. I guess what else can we talk about? We need to just kind of wrap it up. It's getting kind of long here. but So I guess let's talk about some things real quick about um, how to get hired as a second photographer. I mean, obviously, you kind of fell into it, and you kind of I – f- I fell into you, I guess. But, like, if we were to get try to get jobs as a second photographer now, how could we do that? I guess uh, Facebook is probably, like, the best way because, you know, I'm part of a few groups on, uh, like, like, Atlanta second photographers and, and types of things like that. Yeah, but, but, just um, through uh, social media alone, yeah, there's every opportunity groups. and avenue available to people, you know, in today's day and age to, to get involved in the local photography. Um, that's how you meet people. That's how you meet uh, seasoned photographers, and you, you put yourself out there. Yeah, and I mean, not just social media. I think it's really important, too. Like, if you really want to learn from somebody, you know, like, use good old-fashioned phone calls and emails for sure. Like, if you want a second shoot for, like, a particular photo- photographer or whatever... You know, just send them an email. And I'll, I'll say, like, don't get upset if they don't respond back to you um, at all or, or fast enough because it's, like, especially for somebody that's really busy. Like, I know I get a lot of emails of people wanting to second shoot with me or, or wanting something. In it. Like, I'm super busy. I'm, like, right now, obviously, I'm traveling. I'm in Washington, D.C. I, got, I got, did a wedding, like, two days ago. I flew here, and now I'm with you trying to record a podcast. I got a wedding tomorrow. So it's, like, I can't always answer all these emails, like, instantly, you know, but... I definitely get back to everybody for sure, and I don't just let anybody second shoe with me though, or or even assist me, even if they do it for free, just because there's a lot into it, you know. Like you have to understand, like there's a, a risk, you know. Like I'm I'm putting my my name on the line, my brand, my business, you know, like the trust factor, and somebody that I don't particularly know. Um, so I can't just let somebody run rampant at my jobs and my weddings or whatever. Um, but also, it could be a liability of. A potential risk too like if, if they mess something up or they trip over something or something happens you know that could be an insurance liability so like I won't just take anybody you know like I do a lot of vetting and for me what I would do is maybe um, get to know them better <clears throat> like over coffee excuse me I get them you know over coffee or something and then kind of move into maybe letting them assist and or just to show up at a wedding and kind of see how I work and what I do and I, I think even for you you started off literally just kind of carrying bags and helping me out for months before I start saying, hey, you're not doing anything right now. Just start taking pictures. And you're like, what do I do? And I'm like, just take pictures. Shit. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was basically a gopher those first couple uh, yeah. those first couple weddings. You know, grab this bag, carry this light stand, yep. hold this soft box in this position for the next 10 minutes. Like, my forearms, <laughs> like, got seriously jacked. Um, cause those alien bees and you had those heavy light stands yeah, back then. Back then, yeah. Um, but I think you start learning more about the gear and more about like 
setting stuff up and why things were set up a certain way and you know that sort of thing so I've been yeah before I even picked up a camera I mean I had a a solid understanding of shooting manual yeah uh, understanding you know basic lighting um, and you know when I picked up a camera I all I really had to do was look for the composition and focus on the shooting part yeah focus on the shooting yeah and, and, so, and part of that was like kind of like a test to see one like how long how well were you with directions and stuff but I kind of want to see like what you were made of and they kind of teach you slowly you know like there's no there was no real reason for you to shoot photos you know because I need you to assist but once you get better at the assisting part and I think we got that down pretty well and then you would be so good at it that you would just stand around and have nothing else to do so I was like well fuck you know you need to do something you know so that's when you start shooting photos and then you get so good at it to where you could assist me, you could assist the clients and everybody else there, and still second shoot all at the same time. Yeah, I, I became a pretty good uh, second photographer. Yeah, no, I fully agree. You, I mean, all your hair work and all the stuff you used to do with that was pretty amazing, you know? I mean, so, like, before we wrap it all up, so, like, what is it that you're doing now? You moved to Washington, D.C., like, what, five months ago, six months ago, something I moved like that? here in January, so we're, we're going on the end of eight months now that I've been here eight in months. D.C. Yeah. Yeah, so we're in August. Uh, so, yeah, it's been about eight months that I've been here. I haven't done a lot with photography. You know, I, I'd always really worked with, with close friends. I'd, I'd always mm-hmm. worked very closely with you. Um, since moving here, you know, I, I did take another position, um, you know, in my career. Uh, so photography has kind of taken a backseat. So, like, a, like a, another career? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, work in, I work in sales now, and, and that's a far cry from yeah. photography. But then again, not really, you know, yeah, yeah. Ph- photography is a, a lot of sales and hustle as well. Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, literally what you do now as a career is the same thing that I do with photography. Yeah. 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 It, it's the same thing, just a kind of a different method or... A different market. Yeah, a different market. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, like, all right, then what are you... Do you plan on doing anything else with photography? I mean, at least as a hobby or... Well, you know, anything? I've got all the cameras and gear still, so uh, I'm I'm kind of getting back into that putting myself out there phase uh i'm getting back on social media i'm, I'm reaching out to other photographers mm-hmm. um well you, you had you shot something didn't you because i remember you called me and you asked me about contracts and about um shooting an event or, or something you know i have shot a couple events since i've been here my lovely wife uh karina does uh aerial silks which mm-hmm. um you may not be familiar with but if you've ever seen Cirque du Soleil or any of that uh, the, that kind of circus stuff she does uh, the silks and yeah. trapeze and kind of all that cool circus stuff cool she, she's really shit. involved with yeah. that <laughs> so I've gotten to shoot some really interesting circus and very interesting creative stuff you know through knowing her and, and through all the connections she has so yeah I, I've shot a couple cool events here in D.C. And she's a, she's a trainer now too, right? She teaches. Yeah, she teaches yeah. at a, a couple different schools here um, in DC. Do you want to give that a shout out? Is that something you can do? If somebody's interested in doing aerial stuff. So yeah, in uh, DC. <laughs> we, we've got some really cool studios and spaces here. I know right now she's teaching aerial yoga at uh, Monarca in Flight. What that? A yoga aerial yoga. That's aerial a, yoga. That's a thing. Yeah, that that's totally I didn't know a that. thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there's a cool circus scene up here. We've got the Trapeze School of New York. Uh, Philadelphia's <clears> also <throat> got a really cool circus scene, if you people are into that. If you are in Atlanta, I highly recommend the Sky Gym. Uh, that's where she learned the majority of uh, everything she knows. They've got some great trainers over there. And my wife is back in Atlanta a week every month, so uh, maybe you can catch her on one of her uh, fill-in days while she's there at the Sky Gym in Atlanta. Yeah, if anybody's really interested in... Uh, aerial yoga or other things yeah her name's Karina Karina Owens yeah but you can hit me up I, I don't know if we'll have the audience for um, aerial yoga but maybe but um, let's see which beer do you get left uh, I'm sitting about half of my second beer here alright well I just finished my second beer so I guess we're, we're going to wrap it up here but before we go we'll talk about our beer experiences so I tried the Raging Bitch um, from Flying Dog and it was a Belgian IPA, and it was actually really damn good. And then I also tried Snake Dog. Snake Dog. These have some cool-ass artwork, dude. Seriously. Yeah, Flying <laughs> Dog Brewery has, has got just the, the trippiest artwork I think I've ever seen on a... I think my favorite is that one over there, the, the blood with the Dalmatian that's just, like, bloody as hell. That's the best one, I think. Yeah, Bloodline has got a 
Yeah, it, that's it's, it's, it's like kind of it's kind of almost disturbing <laughs> yeah. to, to look at. It's it's like 101 Dalmatians, but like the bad parts of it. A very bloody. Yeah, uh, it's it's a very bloody Dalmatian, but a really delicious beer. Um, if you if you're into citrus notes and uh, you can definitely taste the blood orange on that. The numero uno. I don't even know what you would call that that picture. It it looks like oh maybe is that the numeral one. <laughs> Uh, in or, a sombrero or, and poncho, or, yeah, like a Mexican chili pepper or something. It, it, it's something <laughs> along those lines. I but, think that uh, is number one. Yeah, it's number one. That looks. It's, it's a Mexican poncho and a hat and a mustache. Uh, number that, one. That is a sombrero, <laughs> uh, not a hat. No, and he m- is saying ole, <laughs> um, but no. If you if you're into lagers, I would highly recommend it. Uh, the agave has a nice sweetness to it. The lime has that that zesty citrus flavor. Yeah, Flying Dog Brewery has really. Um, really done some cool stuff out here with these uh, with these beers. All right, so there it is, people. We've done an entire podcast episode in literally two beers, and hopefully you got some good info on how to be a really rad photography assistant and or second photographer, not just at weddings, but that kind of applies to everything, even though we talked a lot about weddings. And hopefully you had a nice review on Aerial Yoga and uh, these beers from Flying Dog. But if you guys have questions or need anything, I guess, you know, just let us know. And thank you so much for agreeing to go on the podcast. No, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Anytime, man. Um, So, yeah, we're going to wrap it up right there, and I'll talk to you guys later. So there it is, guys. I am back in Atlanta finishing up this podcast. Um, I hope that interview with Dan was extremely helpful for you, and you got some good education out of it. If you have any questions or anything, you can join myself and others in the Facebook group, which is at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash photo bar podcast. Or you can just go to the main Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash photo bar podcast. And the group is actually linked there as well. And if you want to, you can email me directly at photobarpodcast at gmail.com. And as always, if you want to check out my work, you can visit my website at www.matthewdrone.com. Instagram is at Matt Druin. Twitter is at Matthew Druin. And Facebook is at facebook.com forward slash Matthew Druin Photography. And I want to make sure you guys never miss an episode, so be sure to hit the subscribe button and do it now so you don't forget to do it later. And of course, share it with your friends and family and anybody else that might want to listen to it. And lastly, you can help us grow by uh, leaving a five-star review on iTunes, the Google Play Store, Stitcher, or wherever you guys listen to podcasts out. It really helps us stay motivated in creating the content, and it helps other people find us so they too can find freedom in their own business and lives. But that wraps up this episode, and I'll talk to you guys next time.